This video was sponsored by Phantom Wallet. Wah! <laughs> you thought I was gonna pop out of that box, didn't you? Well, I'm unpredictable like that. So in this video, we're gonna transform this entire office space. Now this has been a room that has been the catch-all for all of our junk and garbage and tools while I've been remodeling the rest of our house. Well, today is the day I'm finally gonna get all this junk cleaned out and we're gonna transform this into a working office space. Come on in, let me show you what my plans are. doing this home office space for my wife so the design is a little bit dictated by what she wants and what's gonna best suit her needs so along this wall I'm going to do two built-in cabinet units one on each side with a white oak desktop that spans the entire distance she wants a large opening in the middle so that she can sit at a computer and she can also sit at her sewing machine so there's gonna be a lot of room underneath and we have already got all of our outlets up on top, which is nice because there used to be an ugly 1980s desk in here that I quickly ripped out as soon as we moved in. And it's sat like this for years. But we're gonna change that. Then over here, on this side, we've got this natural little built-in alcove here, and I'm gonna fill this with a floor-to-ceiling built-in unit. There's gonna be three banks of cabinet doors on the top with drawers on the bottom. The key here is just a crazy amount of storage to fit art supplies, sewing materials, you know, all the random stuff we don't want laying around on top of the desk. There are some lights in here, some can lighting. We're gonna completely cover those up. There's attic space above this that I can access. So I'm gonna get in the attic and I'm gonna actually mount some gooseneck lights that come straight out and light the built-in. So I'm gonna get my measurements on this. I'm gonna throw it on the computer, design up what we want it to look like, and then we're gonna get out in the shop and we're gonna get this thing built. Alrighty, righty, righty. The first thing I did was just take rough measurements of this little alcove space. I say rough because I'm gonna leave my cabinet carcasses a little small so that I don't have to fight them in place and then I'll trim them out after I get them in there. Now over on this side, I actually already have my cabinet boxes built for this. If you remember back in my cabinet build series, I built a few random cabinets, yeah. Those weren't so random, they were for this space. So with all my measurements and my design figured out, it's over to the wood shop to start ripping down some plywood. Now to build my carcasses, I'm using pre-finished birch ply. And this birch is crazy, look at it, it's weird looking. Anyways, I'm using pre-finished because the outside of the cabinet is gonna be painted and by using pre-finished ply, I don't have to worry about doing anything on the inside. So I just start ripping down a bunch of long sheets that will make up the outer portion of my carcass for my floor to ceiling built-in unit. So I get those all ripped down to width and then it is time to cut them to length. For that, I went and grabbed my handy piece of rigid foam that I can plop them down on top of and trim them down on the track saw, cause that's how I roll. So like I said, I just throw them on the rigid foam, I measure how long I need them to be, and I cut them with the track saw. And I keep cutting them with the track saw. I do a lot of cutting with the track saw cause there's a lot of pieces. After I cut my full pieces to length, I trim down a few smaller pieces that will become my internal shelves and the top of each cabinet. So with all my pieces cut, I need to add a quarter of an inch groove to the back of each one of my pieces that will house my quarter inch back panel. You'll see all this come together here in a little bit. So after setting my blade height to a quarter of an inch high with a quarter of an inch dado in my table saw, I run every piece through until I've got a nice quarter of an inch groove along the back of all of my pieces. Looking just like this. Next, I need to cut a three quarter of an inch dado through the middle and top of each one of my outer carcass pieces. 
I guess this would be a rabbit. I think Dado is running with the grain and rabbit's running across, if I remember correctly. Now these are positioned in the middle of my carcass, so I didn't feel comfortable running them through the table saw, so I just grabbed my router and track system. But you could do the exact same thing with a router and a straight 2x4. I just went a quarter of an inch deep, and then of course I checked to make sure that my plywood would slide nice and snug right in that rabbited out groove thing, which it did. So after doing my middle portion, I moved to the top of my piece and I cut another three quarter inch groove at the top. Now you can see I didn't do it right on the very end. I like to come down just a few inches. It just makes putting the whole thing together a lot easier if you're not working right on the very edge. Again, I checked to make sure it's the right depth and I just kept going until I had six of these pieces in total that will make up the outer portions of my carcass. Then with all of my pieces cut and rabbited out for assembly, it was time to glue and screw everything together. Now the nice thing about this particular cabinet is because it's sandwiched in between two walls, you're not gonna see any of the edges or sides of the carcass. So I can just use exposed screws as my fasteners and a little glue. So after smearing my glue in each one of those grooves, I just plop in my pre-cut middle dividers. One in the middle and one on the top, just like this. Then using these woodpecker 90 degree clampy things, which are awesome when you're doing big cabinets all by yourself, I hook one onto each divider. Hey, how you doing? And while they're firmly held in place, I just send some screws right through the outside of the carcass into those dividers to hold them securely. I do one side with it overhanging my work table, then I spin it around and I do the other side. You got to get a little creative when you're doing big cabinets all by yourself. So for me, that means trying to do as much work as I can with the cabinet laying horizontal and not try and fumble around with it vertical. Now I should note, you see my middle divider comes all the way to the back, but my top stops right at that quarter inch groove. That's so that after we get this assembled, we can slide our quarter inch back panel in and hook it to that top piece. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Then with one side all assembled, I hop up onto my workbench like a flipping ninja and I secure the other side just with a little glue and a few screws, making sure that it is perfectly flush with the front of my cabinet carcass. If it's not flush, hooking your face frame on later is gonna be a royal pain in the butt. So just make sure it's nice and flush. Then once you get that nice and secure, you can climb on down from your workbench as gracefully as possible. I prefer the head first method. Yep. Then you can see the right side here is nice and square because it's well supported by our top and middle divider. But this bottom's a little floppy, like your grandma's neck skin. So we gotta add some more support pieces. For your support pieces, you wanna take your measurements right off of one of your dividers. That way you know it will be exactly the right length. Then for all my additional support pieces, I just used some of the offcuts from my carcass pieces. I trimmed them down to three and a half inches and I cut them to length. I just went ahead and cut all the pieces at once so I would be ready to go for my other carcasses. There's a lot of pieces. And then I added some pocket holes to each end of every single one of those support brace piece things. And then I positioned one support on each side of the bottom, just like this. A question I get asked a lot is, if the outside of the carcass isn't gonna be visible, why bother with pocket holes? Why not just screw directly in from the outside? Well, in my opinion, the pocket holes just hold a little better. You don't have to risk splitting out the end of your plywood, and it just makes it easier and a little cleaner. 
After screwing our two bottom support pieces on, I add two back support pieces. Now these are going to serve two functions. They're going to act as nailer strips to hold our cabinet securely to the wall, and they're also just going to firm up the cabinet and make it a little more rigid. So after hooking it in with pocket screws, I add a few trim head screws just to tie everything together. Next, I take my track saw and I cut down a piece of quarter inch pre-finished ply. This is going to make up our back panel. And if you've done everything correctly and all your measurements are right, it should slide into the back of your cabinet nice and easy. Let's see if I did my job right. Yep, slid in nice and easy, just like I said it would. And then I add one more support piece at the top. Now you could probably forego this piece altogether and just tack that back panel right into the top of the cabinet, but I like to just sandwich it in between the support piece. So first I hook the piece in with a few more pocket screws, and then using some trim head screws, I drill right through that support piece, through that quarter inch panel, and into that upper top of the cabinet box. And just like that, we've built our first carcass. It is all ready to go. One down, two more left. Now again, when you're working with big cabinet boxes by yourself, you gotta get creative on how you move them around. Gravity and physics are your friend. So I just slowly slide the cabinet off the end of the workbench until it hits the ground. And then when you're lifting these, always remember lift with your back that's important i heard that on an infomercial i think and those are words to live by and now in case you're still confused on how these go together i will show you the entire process in one go now i sped this up obviously so you didn't have to watch it in real time but in case you're wondering real time was nine minutes and 52 seconds so pretty quick to get an entire seven foot carcass put together. I've said it once, I will say it again, cabinet building is all in your planning and preparation and cutting of your parts. If you take the time to cut all your parts accurately and have a good plan going into it, then assembly should be a breeze. And just like that, my second carcass is done and I'm ready to use those big back muscles to lift it out of the way. All in all, it was very easy for me to get all three of these carcasses cut and assembled in the course of one day. Now all I need to do is figure out my face frame. This video was sponsored by Phantom Wallet. Now, let me show you my old wallet. <sighs> it's big, it's bulky, it's hard to sit on, and I still can't figure out how to get the credit cards out of this thing. Although I know I put them in there at some point. Anyways, that was all until I found Phantom Wallet. These jazzy, jazzy things. They're super thin, they're streamlined, they hold a crazy amount of cards, and they got this cool little flick thing to fan out your cards for easy access. They come in a variety of different colors. You can upgrade them with cool things like money clips and coin apparatuses. There's a Phantom R, there's a Phantom S, so you got a couple different designs to choose from. If you want to up your wallet game and make it so you're not sitting on a rock and hurting your back and all that stuff, plus just look cool. I get asked all the time in the store, where'd you get that sweet wallet? Well, I got it from Phantom Wallet. You can get one too. The link is in the video description and if you use coupon code bourbon at checkout, you'll get 10% off. So you'll have more money to put inside your phantom wallet. I came out the next morning and I stared at this unit for a while because there was one of two ways I could do my face frame. I could do one giant monstrosity of a face frame in one piece or separate pieces. And then I decided, hey, you only live once. Let's try and make the world's biggest face frame. So I got started first cutting some poplar to length. This will be a paint grade piece, so the face frame will be completely made of poplar. And then I ripped all those pieces down to the right width over on the table saw. 
and I just started putting them in place. I like to start out my face frame by first clamping my outer pieces where they need to go. Once those are clamped in the right position, I can take my measurements for all my internal stretchers. So I measure from outside edge to outside edge and simply subtract the two widths of my face frame. This got me my internal measurements, so I cut my top and bottom piece. Now, my face frame is primarily two and a quarter inches wide, but I always like to make my top and bottom piece a little thicker because I'll usually be adding some trim on the top and the bottom. So once I got all of my exterior frame pieces cut, I hooked them together again, just quick and easy using a pocket hole jig. There was a time in life where I thought I needed to dowel or domino all my face frame pieces together. And then I remembered, oh yeah, they invented this thing called a pocket hole jig specifically for putting face frames together. Why not use that, you moron? So I did, and it is much, much easier. Don't let anybody tell you that pocket holes are bad when it comes to face frame. That's what they're made for, so use them and enjoy them. Just not too much. You don't want it to cross over into other furniture applications where they have no business being. Anyways, in no time I was able to get all of my external pieces hooked together with just pocket holes and glue. Then with my outer frame complete, it was time to add all my internal dividers. Now whenever I'm doing face frames, I never use a tape measure or a ruler. I like to just cut spacer pieces. I apply one at the bottom and one at the top, and that way I know everything's going to be perfectly even and square. So I clamp my little spacers in place, which are actually my internal dividers that I'll use later. And once clamped in place, I hook on all my vertical divider pieces. Then after those vertical dividers are done, I switch over to my drawer dividers. And I do these the exact same way, just by cutting some scrap plywood spacers to determine how tall I want that first divider to be. And then I simply clamp the divider in place and hook it in with some glue and pocket screws. And then once those are in place, I do again the exact same thing on a smaller scale. I've got three separate drawers in each little divided section, so I cut three scrap pieces and make sure that all of them fit perfectly even and this way I know all of my drawers are spaced out correctly. And then it's just a process of clamping them down and screwing everything in place. And just like that I've done it. I've created the world's largest face frame. And before you ask, yes I double checked that it would fit through my front door. So with my face frame all put together, I just clamp it to the carcass to hold it in place. I'm not going to actually install the face frame until we get it in the house. I will be showing you one of my favorite painting methods on this project, and that is, well, you'll just have to wait and see. But, spoiler alert, I'm not going to paint any of this until it all gets put in the office. So, trying to figure that one out. My face frame done, it was time to drill all the holes for my shelf pins. There's a lot easier ways to do this, but I just always use this little plexiglass template. There's bigger templates out there you can do with a router, but hey, my little template works, so don't make fun of me. After drilling all my shelf pin holes, I just quick and easily trimmed down a few shelves out of pre-finished ply, and I plopped them in there. Boom, boom, boom. But Jason, are you just gonna leave that nasty exposed plywood edge? What do you take me for? A fool? Of course I'm not. After cutting my shelves to length, I then cover up that nasty exposed plywood edge with some birch edge banding. Now this is the edge banding that already has the adhesive attached to it, so you simply put it on the front of your plywood and run over it with any household iron. I like to just cut the ends with an X-Acto knife and then I use this little edge banding trimmer to trim off all the little overhang, just like this. And then after doing that, I hit it with a little bit of 220 plywood 
just right on the edge. Try not to scratch up your pre-finished ply. And then to make the birch edge banding blend into the pre-finished ply, I just hit it with a little wipe on poly. You can get pre-finished edge banding, but in my experience, it's just harder to work with because it's impossible to get your edge banding perfect, so you gotta trim it down and sand it, and you end up scratching up that pre-finished edge banding. So I just use the unfinished stuff, and as you can see, the wipe on poly makes it blend in very nicely. And there you go, we have our shelves. So with our carcass and face frame all complete, it is time to move everything into the office and get it installed against the wall. I invited my friend Casey over to help me because I'm lazy and I don't want to carry heavy things all alone. I do have a strong back, but not that strong. So after cleaning out the office, we unclamped the face frame, just moved it out of the way. We'll worry about that later. And we started carrying these cabinet boxes. They're really not that heavy. They're just more awkward than anything else. Thankfully, my house is only about 40 yards away from my shop, so it wasn't too bad to lug each carcass across my driveway and through my front door. Just had to be careful, you know. Didn't want to ding anything up. And once we had each piece in the house, we just slid them into place. Moment of truth. Now, remember I said I wanted to make it just a hair small so we didn't have to fight it into place. It is the worst feeling in the world when you go to put that last unit in and it doesn't quite fit. Ugh. I'm not gonna lie. I was a little relieved that they all slid nicely in place. Next, for the face frame. Like I mentioned, I did measure beforehand to make sure that it would squeeze through my front door, which it did, barely. But barely's all you need for woodworking. And for making scotch, actually. Oh wait, that's barley. Man, I love scotch. Oh. Yeah, anyways, I'm getting off topic. Once I brought the face frame inside, I just slid it in place. Now I'm not actually installing it yet, I just wanted to make sure that this was going to fit because it is slightly bigger than my carcass. As you can see, there's a little gap on each side of the face frame. Oh my gosh, jeez. Oh. Anyways, little gap on each side of the face frame, which is what I want. We will trim that out when we're all done. So knowing that I could get my face frame in place, I moved it out of the way and now it was time to hook our carcasses to the wall. But before we could do that, we needed to first hook our carcasses together. So after clamping them so they were nice and even, I just held them in place with a few trim head screws right behind where the face frame is going to land so they will be concealed. Then I checked to see how much shimming we were going to have to do to get this whole thing level and square. And would you believe it, we lucked out again, and it was perfectly level. Hey, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, you just rejoice. So, knowing that it was nice and level, I found a few studs, and I attached each carcass to the back wall directly into a stud. Then, using a few shims in the gap on either side of the carcass, I shimmed it up so that it was nice and secure, and I attached it to the wall on each side. The only place I could find studs here were my base plate at the bottom and at the top, but I think that'll do. Now to hook on the face frame. For gluing on face frames, I always use tight bond, quick and thick. The thick is the important aspect here because as you squeeze it onto your carcass, it doesn't run all over the place and wind up in a soupy mess on the floor. So I squeeze a little bit out on each exposed plywood surface and I wiggle that face frame into place very carefully, making sure not to scratch or ding my wall. Then while I held it in place, Casey came in with the 16 gauge nailer and just tacked it on there. We'll fill all these holes and sand before paint, so don't you worry your little head. Next, it was time to install our other cabinets on the other side of the room. Now if you're like, hold up, 
I don't remember you making these. Well, I mentioned at the beginning of the video that these were already made. I made these cabinets in my cabinet building tutorial series where you can go watch by clicking that little button at the top of the screen. The question I got a lot after that build series is how do you attach your kick plate to the cabinet carcass? Because as I mentioned in that video, I like to make my kick plate separate from my cabinet box. Well, the answer is, I don't. I do not attach the two together. I get my kick plate in, I get them level, and then I screw them to the wall. Then, I bring my cabinet carcass in. Now I know that my kick plate is already perfectly level, so all I need to do is drop my cabinet carcass directly on top of that kick plate, and then, once it is in place and exactly where I want it, I attach my cabinet carcass to the wall. The cabinet carcass and the kick plate are not attached to each other, but because they are both securely attached to the wall, they can't go anywhere. Don't worry about attaching your carcass to your kick plate. You just don't need to. Now that all of my carcasses are in place and secured to the wall with my face frame attached, it's time to trim them out and make them look pretty. So I always start by trimming the top and the bottom first. First I'll add this top trim piece that will go right against the ceiling and cover up that gap at the top of the cabinet. Yep, smells like it could, tastes like it could, yeah, that'll cover up that gap. Now I always like to make this pretty tight, meaning that when I first get it in there, there's usually a little bow in the middle which is fine as long as the bow's not so drastic you can't bend it out. As you bend it, it'll push firmly against your outer two edges. So a little long is okay. This is only half inch trim, so it's pretty bendy. Once I get it in place, I tack it on and I measure the bottom of the cabinet for my quarter round. A lot of times people will just bring the baseboard across the front of the cabinet like this, but because this is going to be painted black and my baseboard is white, I didn't want the attention drawn to the bottom like that. So I just cut and tacked on a piece of quarter round that will be painted to match the cabinet. Then I measure for my side trim pieces. To trim out the sides, I'm just using little pieces of quarter inch scribe trim, some people call it pencil trim. The nice thing about this trim is because it's only a quarter of an inch, it's very bendable. So it's easy to bend it to fit the contour of the wall. So it's great for covering up little gaps and seams like on the edge of the cabinet. And once it's painted, it looks good. Like it was supposed to be there all along. Like you designed it that way. Like you're some brilliant, amazing woodworker, not just a lame guy trying to cover up your mistakes. Anyways, after the whole thing was trimmed, it was time to start installing my drawer slides. Now, I always use undermount drawer slides, as I've mentioned in the past, because they are the best and easiest to install. The brand I use is Blum, and I will put a link in the video description. So first, I just cut a few scrap pieces of ply, stick them directly behind my face frame, and I mark out exactly where my face frame hits those pieces of plywood. Then I attach these little brackets that come with the undermount drawer slides directly to those scrap pieces. Then all I have to do is attach those scrap pieces to the back of my carcass. I know that those brackets will perfectly line up with my front face frame because that's where I got my measurements. And then all I have to do is slide my drawer slides right onto those brackets and eventually hook them to the face frame with a single screw. It literally could not be easier. You just mark, you hook on your brackets, you install them on the back, and plop in your drawer slides. Try and do that with side mount drawer slides. Oh yeah, you can't. I rest my case. And with that, our carcass is all ready for drawers, drawer faces, and cabinet doors. Wait. You didn't think I was gonna finish all this in one video, did you? That's way too much work. But don't worry, I'll finish it in the next video where I show you how I paint in place, install all the drawer faces, drawers, cabinet doors, put the white oak top on the other side, lights, 
baseboard and make this whole place look flipping fantastic. But until then, make sure you subscribe down below, click that notification bell so you know when the next video comes out. Oh, and go follow me on Instagram, check out the links down below in the video description and a bunch of that other stuff. I'm just gonna be in here taking a nap.